All right, we're we're here at the Vintage Computer Festival Midwest Virtual Edition. I'm here with Karen Doniker and I'm Bill Degnan, and we're here to just you know kick things off here with a uh, short welcome video, telling you a little bit about Canon Classic, which is our project that we've been working on for now one year. Our anniversary is coming up September 26th, 2020. You're all invited, and uh, just uh, so excited to be here. I'm just going to tell you what's going on and uh, tell us tell little stories about uh, how we've been uh, uh, involved with the Vintage Computer Festival Midwest all these years, I guess. So, Bill, you've been to um, many Midwest events throughout the years. I think three or four. Okay. Yeah. Well, I know a couple years ago, I really enjoyed heading to Chicago with you and meeting everybody in the Midwest. And the Midwest had its own feel and, yeah. and something special yes, about it. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about your impression of the Midwest. Well, I've been to the Vintage Computer Festivals when they were out just out in California. It was just called the Vintage Computer Festival. Salam, Mr. Ramos. And, um, and then uh, the Vintage Computer Festival East, mm -hmm. which was really kind of taking the, the mantle of, of the of the of the the west version and planting it in the east coast and it was formalized and there were contests and lots of speakers and so on and prizes and awards for the best uh, uh, exhibits and whatnot um, and the uh, then later on there is a, there is a, also I think a vintage computer festival in Munich and all over the world but I, I never actually went to those but when the Midwest started um, and that's been going on forever with the emergency Commodore meetings and a whole bunch of other uh, uh, specialty groups all met together and it's really been an independent independent spirited place uh, much different than any other festival for sure uh, much looser uh, the exhibits are along with people working on things people selling things and it's just much more of almost like a party feel a lot less formal than any, any other computer festival and it kind of set a new tone that i think other festivals have kind of picked up yeah, and, uh, it was definitely a lot of fun when I was there. Yeah, so definitely. Uh, I was glad to meet everybody. Yeah. Um, so with our one year anniversary coming up, um, we have the event coming. What what's are we going to be ready for it? Is you know what what can people expect? Well, we're we're uh, it's a one year anniversary. COVID nineteen has made it difficult for everybody. We're actually going to have an actual event here, and what we're going to do is we're just going to have. We have a relatively large parking lot. Um, it's not huge, but it's big enough to have some tables and have some um, like a swap, so a swap meet, and uh, you know a little bit of food out there. And then what we'll do is because we have all these new exhibits and we have a new third uh, room at a, at kind of classic, we're going to let people in in a metered fashion so that it's safe and, and everyone gets a chance to see the exhibits, but they have somewhere to go while they're waiting, and then they can come back out and just kind of swap around. So we're hoping. It's a one-time way of doing it, but we're hoping it'll work. Yeah, and you've done your homework. Look, we have COVID safety factors right. all throughout, so that's um, been a really nice thing to see. Right. So what makes Kenna Classic different? Well, Kenna, is, yeah, Kenna, we didn't want it just to be another vintage computer festival. We like the vintage computer festival East and Midwest and West, and, there, and, and there's one out in the, in, the, in the Northwest, and of course the one in Atlanta and Roswell. Um, we just wanted it to be a little bit loose, not looser, but we wanted it to be more, uh, we, we, we're running what we consider to be more of like a museum gallery. And so we wanted to have, have the layout and have things be a little bit different and, and have different types of computers, you know, not, not necessarily have, you know, the checklist of all the ones that you're supposed to have. We tried to find things that have a story. So our place is about the stories. It's about why is vintage computing interesting? And it isn't just what other people say. You know, everybody has their opinion about what is vintage computing. So Kenneth Classic is our vision of what is vintage computing. It's not just the 8-bit computers as much as we love those. We also wanted to show the 16-bit and 32-bit computers that are historic. We also wanted to show things from the 50s and the 40s. We even have an original newspaper from uh, the Babbage announcement yeah. when that when that differential engine was, yeah. was announced. So in the 1830s. Yeah, so we really wanted it to be a place where you could say, I've been to Kenna Classic and it's not just another Me Too place. It's a place where we're going to actually see something different. Um, and that's our contribution to uh, to computer history and, and creating a continuity. Right. 
that's what really helps me um, understand you know the world of image computing is that that story made a difference is there a particular exhibit that you're most excited about or a particular computer or a story well we we do have things coming in all of the time and we get a lot of donations so i wouldn't necessarily say there's one favorite but i can't think about the time we had a guy come in from ici and he told us the story about making styrofoam. Do you remember that? Yes. And he had a Ohio Scientific Challenger. I don't remember if it was a 4P or if it was a, a Challenger 2. And we have it on display. But it was about this regret that he felt about making styrofoam. And, right. and it was that computer reminded him of the days when he worked at ICI and he made styrofoam and how he did experiments and how they used that computer to to replace the need of having like a larger computer and it could do quick experiments and, and it was more analog to digital type stuff. Yeah, he did a lot of testing on that computer yeah. and it was, I, I remember that day because it was, I was the one who asked, you know, well, what did you test on the computer? And he was really sad to say that it was styrofoam and he said, had we known then what styrofoam would do to the environment, but you know, it was really um, quite a nice time to see him really, um, kind of embrace it, that had you not experimented with styrofoam, had you not taken the computer to the next level, had things not progressed, what else would we have? Right, and so we try, we write down the story behind the computer, and every computer that is on the shelves at Canon Classic has a story behind it. And if anything, you want to just try to stop us from telling a longer story. But, <laughs> but really, it's, it's, it's really about the fact that a person walks into Canon Classic, they look around, and then they see the thing that reminds them of the story and they immediately tell their, their younger one or their, their husband or their wife or a talk, they talk about how their Uncle Ernie used to have a computer just like that. And they remember when they were kids seeing it. And it just brings those stories and it puts cultural uh, context behind the computers that are on display. And that's, what, that's really what we were going for. Yeah. My favorite story was the calculator story. Ah, yeah. That was my favorite. So we have a, I guess it's the first um, digital calculator. Well, we just have a calculator. It's, it's the um, it's the Frieden 132, and it, it could do square roots. Oh, that's right. It was the first calculator that could do square roots. And a woman comes in, and her young daughter and son were there. Mm -hmm. And um, the the woman were not, you know, had lots of memories. Um, or actually, I think it was her grandchildren. Um, and and so we pointed out that this was the calculator that first did square root. And um, the, the mom that was there with the grandmother looks at the little girl and said, now imagine if you had to carry that calculator in your pocket. Mm -hmm. And the little girl opened this little pink purse, pulled out a calculator, and it's all that she had asked for for the holidays was a calculator that she could carry in her purse. And she sat mesmerized by the museum. So mm -hmm. there's a next generation of computer enthusiasts. Yeah. I should also say that if it wasn't for my friends um, in the Vintage Computing oh, Community yeah. who helped restore the Freedom 132, we have workshops here as well where we get together and we, we work on computers. We pick a theme, maybe we'll do Apple, maybe we'll do S100 or disk drive repair or something like that. And we all get together and work on those. And I've been running workshops since 2006 either at my house or I used to run them with the Vintage Computer Federation um, and then uh, then we brought them in the Wilmington and you know, now we're doing them here and that's also part of what we do here. It's almost like a facility for that. All right, so we want to just, <laughs> we want to just wrap this up, I guess. Um, I, uh, I just wanted to say we can't wait to uh, greet our visitors in a couple of weeks. We really love the Vintage Computer Festival Midwest. Um, we just wanted to give you news about what's happening on this side of uh, the United States, just south of Philadelphia in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. Um, you can visit our website at kennettclassic.com and it's affiliated with vintagecomputer.net. So vintagecomputer.net is the technical stuff and kennettclassic.com has the schedule and the stories and, and the pictures and so on. Yeah, and if you and your family are making their way over um, to the East Coast and you wanna make a little bit more of the trip, then we're happy to help you with Many of the other features around the area. It's a great location with lots of safety. All right, see yeah. In the beginning, after World War II, we really had the coming together of the analog and the digital computer world. You had your ENIACs, and then you've got your Mark 8s, and you've got your Univacs, and you've got your IBM systems. 
Um, we also have on display the Univax One. Oh, this is a, a drum memory controller or a component from a drum memory. Uh, drum memory used to spin rather than the hard drive platter spin. The entire drum would spin. Um, an IBM uh, 650 actual code that was uh, done uh, when I IBM wanted to get college students to um, uh, become computer scientists. It provided and made it easy for universities to get uh, the IBM 650 computer, and they actually would like be the only computer in the state. So Iowa State had the Cyclone. They named their IBM 650, and they would have their best students working on it. And I have um, here in this display cabinet actual programming code from Iowa State, and we also have Michigan, and we've got uh, uh, um, the Iliac computer from the uh, Chicago, and so on. IBM Stretch, uh, Univac 2. And, and other computers are, are featured here in the beginning. We also, of course, had our analog computers, and they were they were um, used to gather. Uh, it was like kind of like today's um, machine of things, where you're uh, gathering continuously data, and it would give you the ability to, to generate things like slopes and to calculate um, in real time. But it wasn't a program like an electronic computer, but it would be married to an electronic computer by um, taking data like this, and this is uh, just a representation of the voltages in the falling body problem that came with the heat kit EC1. This is a 1959 computer. Of course, the uh, oscilloscope is a lot newer, but it demonstrates how uh, data was being transmitted through the, um, the, the analog uh, uh, equipment, the capacitors and so on, and represented as voltages. Back then, they might have just used a paper readout instead. From 1978 to about 1993, 94, 95, um, these devices weren't directly connected to the internet, but they did provide a lot of the functionality that we today use in our smartphones. They just didn't also do everything that a smartphone does today, but they certainly were uh, integral to uh, the businessman or the student or somebody that just wanted to keep track of, of their schedule and, uh, and or actually do computing a computer like an LGP-30 was a real-time system in that a person could sit down at it, use it, program it, save their program, and see the results right away instead of putting, um, putting it on punch cards and having it run later. A, uh, one of the very first uh, recording uh, CR uh, chromium tapes or, or, or fer iron ferrite tapes um, that was uh, the IBM Magnetic Tape Selectric uh, Typewriter from 1964. Uh, we have a lot of other things. Uh, we have um, examples of uh, the Univac, uh, 1218, 1219 uh, componentry. That's just uh, how small things had become um, from the days uh, even um, uh, 10 years earlier. The front panel from the DDP 516 by Honeywell, and this front panel and illustrates here by this gentleman actually using it at his desk to teletype in the computer itself. This was the first uh, our, a first router um, control panel. So the, the first internet router that, that the, what became ARPANET was actually run, packets were actually run through a DDP-516 like this. We have um, IBM 360 um, core memory. Um, we've got some uh, cord modules from the uh, control data 6600. This is an interesting item that you will only see at Kennet Classic. This is a 1969-70 AlphaCom glass terminal and it's really neat it looks a lot like a computer from you know from the mid 70s but it's actually designed by a gentleman who lived nearby here if you open this up you would see it's uh, done by hand and it's got a component it's got a combination of wire wrap and and um, boards and it's got uh, even a, even a board with made out of cardboard in there space war now, video games in this article were essentially a futuristic thing that could be done actually with a computer. Instead of using a pinball machine, you could actually play video games. And this article talked about how the evenings and into the night, um, college students who worked in computer labs during the day would then use the computer, like a PDP-8 or uh, you know, other types of computers, to actually play video games where they would actually shoot each other with... Uh, ships that looks very similar to what you would see in asteroids. Um, Ted Nelson, visitor of the Vintage Computer Festivals and um, known to most of us um, in, the, in the vintage computing world, wrote 
is this is really computer live is really a kind of a uh, uh, a greatest hits of his writings up to the point and the idea being you have women's lib well why not computer lib give everybody a computer not just businesses but if everybody knows how to use a computer then that means everyone will have the power of a computer and that means that they'll understand them and they'll be able to come up with creative and interesting ways to use them here's, here's an interesting uh, computing device this is a trainer called the CompuLogic Tutor um, it was uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the CompuLogical Tutor by um, CompuAid. And this is a uh, pretty rare uh, machine that was used to teach logic. This exhibit is, is, uh, might be familiar to some of you at the Vintage Computer Festival Midwest because we actually, um, I actually brought this with me on the plane. Now this, of course, was what I wanted to do um, at the Vintage Computer Festival Midwest, but um, was unable to bring this much stuff. But this really does show you uh, the, the concept of the user group. Because MITS could not make a, uh, a small enough calculator to compete with the Casio, they put out the MITS Altair computer, which started a computer revolution because Bill Gates, in part, made a very successful and usable basic that ran on this thing. And if it wasn't for Casio beating out MITS on the calculator business, it wouldn't have started Microsoft on an Altair. Many of you have heard of the Apple One, but you probably haven't all heard of the Jolt, which is also a 6502 single board computer. But the difference is, this one came before the Apple One, and this computer was had, ran the TIM monitor, and it, and it really did a lot of the things, the same exact things as any 6502 computer would do, very bare bones. But it was good enough for Atari developers to use to create the first combat game. So the 2600 um, game console that you see here came from a jolt and, and, and you can see this actually at the Computer History Museum in California but here you can also see that same uh, very uh, hard to find uh, jolt 6502 computer um, on display as well.